Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel, uh, and this is Global Connections. Uh, we're, we're talking about the Philippines versus China in the South China Sea uh, with security analyst Carla Cruz, who joins us from Manila. Here's a map of the area. We'll be talking about this map through the show. And Carla, welcome to the show. So happy to have you here. Hi, Jay. Good morning from the Philippines. So let's talk about the South China Sea. I mean, we all hear about it, and I'm afraid a lot of people don't know exactly where it is or what it means. So can you, we'll, we'll show the map, but you need to tell us why it's important. The string of islands under Taiwan, kind of in the middle of everything, it's the Philippines. Um, but we are the Mexico of Asia, as Joe Coy says. So we were um, conquered by the Spanish, uh, very different from, I guess, the rest of the region. We're the only Catholic country in this another side of the world. Yeah. Okay. So why is the South China Sea important? You know, I was on a cruise um, not six months ago in the South China Sea. My wife said to me, uh, are you sure it's safe? I said, yeah. no, I'm not sure it's safe. <laughs> Is it safe? Where did you go? Where did you go on? Oh, cruise? from Indonesia to uh, Thailand uh, to Vietnam to Singapore. There, I guess there's a lot of uh, navies there, so you would have been safe. <laughs> um, but is it okay? So what is happening? You know, when you, I like, I, I was trying to find a way to explain this to your viewers, especially because there's so many more Filipinos there than people realize. And the problem is not only a Filipino problem, but it's a global problem. Um, it's a Pacific problem, first of all. And um, what is at stake and what we have to come together to understand is one, we're not talking to somebody on the other side who sees um, the same kind of adversaries as we do. We don't share the same value system. So it, it hasn't been since time immemorial, right? But since 1989, um, China's rhetoric changed towards America and its allies, including the Philippines. And um, the, you know, just like America, China also has this whole patriotic national education. But I think there's this at an extreme. And so while this, nine dash line, 10 dash line, maybe tomorrow it'll be an 11 dash line, you know, comes um, at the end of the day, we, we cannot live together in harmony. And I think that's what everybody wants. And so that's what's making problems. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Well, but they're economically driven. Uh, they want to control traffic in the South China Sea. And uh, they're geo geopolitical. They want to control territory wherever they can. And uh, unfortunately, you're, you're part of their effort in that regard. Uh, you talked about the 9-9 line. 9-9 yes. line and the 10 line and 10 line and the 11-line. Yes. Line. Yes. Line. That was a joke. Yeah, I know. It's it's really 9 and 11. It's no 10. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so, yes. Why don't, why don't we put the map up and you can give us a kind of handle on where those lines are and what they mean and whether they are real or unreal and, and who likes what line? Well, okay, when you, China claims that uh, they're, they've had this map since, I don't know who's, um, you know, uh, I don't know whose time, right? And this nine dash line was what we, the Philippines took to The Hague and was awarded um, territorial claim over, if we can draw it, it's from all the way from, basically from Japan, like the Senkaku Islands, all the way down to Malaysia. So they pretty much own the entire South China Sea. Um, and has no, has not considered anything under UNCLOS, which they are a party to actually, um, that mentions the uh, exclusive economic zones of countries, um, archipelagic sea lanes that should be um, respected when uh, practicing freedom of navigation, for example. So it's kind of this convoluted convenience that they have. Um, but when it doesn't suit them, obviously, uh, then they they try and they try and push their their line. 
That's mm. how I think, yeah, the simplest way to explain it. Well, I thought the uh, that, that proceeding in The Hague, which was the first time under the Law of the Sea Convention, as I recall, mm. uh, that somebody took a dispute like this over exactly what China was entitled to, um, um, that, that dispute, they did not participate. In, in, no, that, they did in not. that controversy, even though they yeah. are a member of the Law of the Sea and all that, uh, which yeah. I, I thought was interesting. And the Philippines uh, won, am I right? The, they, the Philippines yes. won that that yeah. arbitration uh, on, under the Law of the Sea, and, mm -hmm. and they won in The Hague. And then there was a, a, de a decision that favored, that agreed with the Philippines, um, you know, uh, uh, line in the sea uh, and its claims. And so mm -hmm. the Chinese completely ignored that, which I think yeah. the world condemned them for that. They didn't participate, uh, and then they ignored the result, and and uh, they're just being bullies. That's what it looks like to me. What do the people in the Philippines feel about that? You know, a good example actually is the U.S. Um, respecting the rule of law, and we just talk about rule of law, and um, you know whether the U.S. isn't a party to clause, but they respect the rules that come with UNCLOS, whether or not they're a party to it. China does not, right? And, you know, I think that the Philippines at first, you know, we're, we're a nation of um, 7,107 islands and a people of 120 million population strong, right? And um, it's hard to get everybody to understand something that's like very big and kind of national security related like how do you explain to somebody that like you know our power grid it has uh, foreign ownership and and you have a huawei whose whose devices are are tapped but you know a, few, a couple of days ago we had an incident where a uh, commercial vessel rammed into a fishing boat in the area where uh the 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 barriers were cut out and um three people died um, and, uh, this is now people are, this is not the first time this has happened, but I think this is the worst because one, the vessel didn't even stop. What was the nationality of the vessel? Marshall Islands. And what, what about the other vessel? Filipino, Filipino fishing vessel. Okay. All right. And, Continue. It, and it's two small vessels. So it was anchored, um, because of the weather. You know, when they're fishing, their lights are on. You're not going to miss them, right? And they all have transponders because they're over 30 metric tons. They can't sail out here over 30 metric tons without a transponder, at least, or a radio. So they definitely knew they were there, okay? Um, this uh, P Pacific Anna, um, a, an oil tanker with uh, the Marshall Islands, registered in the Marshall Islands, um, in that too early in the morning, um, rammed into it, just rammed straight into it and killed three fishermen. They did not stop. Um, so the other fishermen in the smaller boats had to go back. The boat had completely capsized and cut in half. Um, they had to retrieve the bodies of their three um, companions and then bring them to shore. This is 190 nautical miles off the shore in Bajo de Basinlo. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'll leave it up to you. To look off at what, what shore? Off what? The, the Filipino shore? Yeah, the Philippines. Yes. So, so well the, within the, the economic said. zone is 200 yes. miles, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Correct. That's correct. Um, you, you can look at the ownership. You can look up where the ship has been and if it's really been a, uh, a, um, an oil tanker. Let's put it that way. Um, but what needs to be highlighted is the irregular gray zone that China operates in and that we as people, our, our lives are really, um, are really disturbed. We cannot fish in our waters um, because even if they say we can fish, they come and harass our fishermen or they, you know, one day they'll shoot them away. Um, Vietnam is the same. Um, and really for centuries we've lived in harmony with Vietnam and Malaysia. And no matter what conflict we have, we've been able to resolve. So in as much as they say ASEAN is useless, ASEAN is useless maybe, yeah, because we don't want to confront each other, but ASEAN's useful because we have been able to live this way. And only when these people have come in, have they, has this happened, right? So 
so again, our fishermen are dying. Our fishermen cannot fish. And even if it was an accident, they could have stopped and brought them to. to are you saying that the shore. oil tanker was Chinese? Um, it appears that it is owned by a Chinese company. Yes. Mm. Well, there's been a lot of uh, incidents uh, over the past year, and, and it's increasing, isn't it? I mean, for example, I read about this barrier that the Chinese put down that to stop Filipino fishermen uh, yes. from fishing. And uh, for yes. Mar Marcos Jr. Uh, instructed his Coast Guard to go out there and cut that barrier, cut, a, cut yes. the line to it so it folded. And then the yes. Chinese were all hoo-hoo about it. And uh, they said, this is a provocation. Um, but they oh, they said they cut it. They said they cut it. Not really? Us. We have yes. this photographs in the newspaper of a, of a guy from the Filipino Coast Guard showing that he cut it. So this is interesting. <laughs> that was their press release to their to their country that they cut it because uh, it was um, endangering the 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 corals and I don't know what story they put out. Yeah. Yeah, but they also they also attacked the Philippines for provocations. And this is all very provocative. Kind of thing. Yeah. Although they didn't do anything yeah. about, it. they said they they there had to be some response, but there was no response except the rhetoric. And so, I mean, it just goes on and on, and maybe some lying in there too, um, some propaganda in there too. Um, but that's that's not a happy time. And then there was another yeah. one where there's a a, a Filipino ship um, that was um, uh, that was used as a residence, and uh, yes. What did the Chinese do with that? So the is that the um, Sierra Madre, DRP yes, Sierra Madre? Yes, yes, the Sierra Madre. Okay. So the Sierra Madre was actually marooned in that area in 1998 because that's those are our islands, right? And we don't obviously have the money to build these monstrous, you know, artificial islands and set up a, a base, but to you know, to lay our flag and stake our claim, we marooned a boat, which is kind of smart for a third world country, I must say, Jay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, they're pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you're so there's dealing with more. China, you know, <laughs> stroke for stroke. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, and, and yesterday I, I went to visit our troops that do their resupply and, um, and just to see them and ask them, you know, how is it? And they said, you know, ma'am, every day is a different day. And every day they get braver. And they think that that's going to be the day. That's going to be the day that they're going to be shot at. And that's going to be the day that it's going to all start. And, and um, you know, they're ready. I mean, it's like the Filipino has so much heart, right? The Chinese, I don't know how much heart they have. or I don't know how far they're going to go. Because uh, they actually haven't really gone to war. A war this big, Jay, if, if you study it, right? Um, and our numbers show that their attrition before they would even begin is about 30%. So I don't know how well they would do, you know. Mm, well, you know, let's talk about, uh, let's take another thread now. Let's take the thread of the American military and its presence in the Philippines. When I was in the service, was in the 60s, we had Sangley Point, we had, um, we had Subic Bay, and uh, there were others too. Um, all around the Philippines. And you were mentioning before the show that um, they went away, uh, that the United yes. States pulled all those bases uh, in what, in the 90s, I guess? 92, uh, yeah. 92. Yes. 92. Uh, le leaving yes. no American military bases. So can you continue the story on from there about what happened okay. with military presence in the Philippines? So in 1992, basically, um, they were completely removed. Uh, by Senate legislature, I think one, one vote, one anyway. And so, you know, um, it slowed down our military's uh, progress because much of the rent that was being paid um, was going to modernizing our military. Anyway, cut a long story short, um, in 1997, the Visiting Forces Agreement was signed, which allowed for troops to rotate every six months in our bases. And um, as as the, I guess, as the threat increased um, with our neighbor from the north, then um, there was a need to, uh, you know, stock weapons here. Um, we used them as forward locations. 
and, um, you know, and actually train and be interoperable with each other. So the Balikatan exercises happened, which happened once a year. And that last year was the biggest, 40,000 troops from both countries. Um, and we now have games year round um, with our partners and allies. And um, not only with the military, but I think there's a lot of civil military. Um, I'm a civilian in, in the defense sector. So there's a lot of civilian military cooperation and we've learned so much. And, you know, so we've gone from, from VFA to EDCA um, and now we have nine EDCA bases. Um, two of them are up north, uh, three, four of them are up to the northern side and then some closer to Palawan and then in the center. But again, we're going to be adding um, some in the Pacific side. These are American um, bases. We should talk about. No, no, no. So these are Filipino bases. So it's unconstitutional to have American-owned bases. Foreigners also cannot own land in the Philippines. So what we've been able to do is allow for the Americans to um, to be present in our bases, help us um, build out our bases, fortify our bases, and actually locate in our bases. So we live in the same barracks. We eat the same food. Um, we, you know, we hang out together, and 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 it's amazing. It's an amazing um, setup that I think you know is admirable for two sovereign nations to sit side by side with each other and actually um, work side by side. Well, we've been close, you know. Actually, uh, we were close uh, after what eighteen ninety eight and the Spanish American mm -hmm. War. Uh, we were close, certainly, um, with MacArthur coming back. Um, yeah. in the Second World War. And, you know, we have a, a very close relationship with the Philippine, with the Philippines. And, and you know uh, that Hawaii has tons and tons of Filipino families here who uh, in, enjoy Hawaii and across the country. So there's a certain shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder relationship. And therefore, you know, it only, it only fits that we have um, a geopolitical relationship as well and a military defense uh, relationship. So I want to yeah. talk about um, I want to talk about military defense. You know, in that incident where the uh, uh, the uh, Filipino Coast Guard cut the cable, um, there was a, an article that said that Fernando Marcos Jr. would would not have would not have taken that step because it was a risky step. He could have he could have had a bad reaction from China, but he did that because uh, Joe Biden is closer to the Philippines now. And he, he he swears protection to the Philippines. Um, what is the situation as far as you're concerned? Um, I think it takes to to tango, right? But the relationship, like I told, like you know, goes very deep. Douglas MacArthur, more than I shall return, his most second most famous quote is, "Give me um ten thousand Filipino soldiers, and I will conquer the world." <laughs> right? So, I mean that I love. And Filipino soldiers are are different. Filipinos are different, right? So, one, we have a mutual defense treaty, um, which was signed in 1956, I think, which um, any attack on the Philippines or on the U.S. May, is an attack on uh, the other um, and, you know, guarantees each other um, the protection. But I, I would say that under Joe Biden, I'm not saying as a, as just a, as a de, for a Democrat president, but under Joe Biden, um, yes, there has been a lot of movement, and um, the commitment made, uh, especially by both houses. So there was a hearing last week um, in the lower house, your lower house, and uh, we've had several visits from, um, for example, Senator Rick Scott of Florida, is. Um, very, very supportive of the Philippines and has taken the time to understand what the issues are, right? More than just military assistance, Jay, I think that the Philippines needs to become part of the defense supply chain, which will allow us to contribute to the defense economy of the U.S. We cannot just be a receiver of goods. We cannot just be a receiver of technology. We have to contribute somehow. Um, to this partnership, right? And I think that's the most important and logical step forward. And our president Marcos has a uh, has a very very strong economic program. And I I believe when he sees that that this is what Joe Biden also brings to the table, 
he will definitely um he'll definitely see that and make that happen. Now that's very important because it it helps your economy, doesn't it? Big time. Yeah. So and... I actually wanted to add. You mentioned Subic Bay earlier. Mm. So Subic Bay was taken uh, was um uh, returned to American ownership, but through a private deal, um through Cerberus. So they own a, a facility called Aguila, um which used to be the Subic Bay Subic Naval Base. And then was taken over by Hanjin Heavy Industries of Korea. Then they um, went into uh, receivership in 2017, I believe. And then Cerberus purchased the debt and took over the facility. And they're they're back to building ships and and repairing, um, you know, military vessels for for this for this side of the world. So you know, it looks very very promising, and and I believe that that's the start of a really great uh, economic partnership for the defense sector. Yeah, and and of course, there you know the U.S. has lots of reasons to be friendly and to support the Philippines. Lots of reasons. It's yeah. not not just the people, the culture, um, you know, the respect for the character, um, you know, the Filipinos, but it's um, and all the economy for that matter, because it's your location yeah. that counts. And you know, just a stone's throw away is Taiwan. And China and Taiwan, which is you know explosive, and it seems like every day it gets more explosive. And and what happens yeah. with you guys in the South China Sea is, um, you know, sort of instructive about what the Chinese would do to Taiwan. Um, how do yeah. you feel about that? How do you feel about the role of the Philippines in protecting Taiwan, in joining with the United States in protecting Taiwan, and other countries like the Quad uh, down there in protecting Taiwan? You can see it. You can feel it. It's right out there. Yeah. Um, you know, Jay, we're preparing. The sad thing is war is never something that we know what is coming, right? When Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Pearl Harbor happened, nobody knew that that was the kind of war we were going to fight. And sadly, I think we're not prepared for the war we're about to fight. If we were just waiting for a bomb to fall, I think we would be okay because we have all the detectors in the world. We have all of that, right? But I think we're fighting a different war. We're fighting a war of the mind, okay? China has taken a lot of American, um, American uh, intellectual property. So how does that, I mean, that is a huge telltale of how, they're, how they proceed, right? And how they move forward. They have no respect for other countries' positions? Do you think they have any respect for a person's decision-making capabilities? They will do anything in their power to make everybody become like them. And that's what worries me about their presence here, the money that they throw around developing countries, the money that they can throw around the Pacific Islands, for example, who are, you know, could be much worse off than we here in the Philippines are. And I think that's also the direction that I'd like to take another conversation is how can the Philippines lead and move and become kind of a leader to these smaller Pacific islands, knowing that we have some kind of shared history, um, you know, and then kind of it, it then goes into Hawaii. It's like a, a, the Pacific reunification in a way, right? Because that's a much bigger um, problem if that becomes a problem than just the South China Sea, which is easier to contain, I believe. Yeah, that's that makes you very important because um, you know Pacific Islands have to have what do you call it geographical leadership. Um, yes. So many places uh, around you need to have um, you know a, a, a successful uh, country with good mm -hmm. uh, diplomatic relations and all that mm -hmm. uh, to be a, a leader uh, and to yeah. bring them together and uh, yeah. and to counteract um, what what China is doing has been doing. Yes. And will do. Yeah. So you you are very important in setting the the, the tone um, for yes. for this whole region, especially with regard to Taiwan. Yeah. Hmm. Yes, I think China will do whatever they want about Taiwan. I'll be honest with you. Nobody can stop Xi Jinping unless he realizes that that will not do him any favors. He's he's so set, and I think it's just a matter of time. I think the the Philippines needs to just 
you know, accept that they'll do whatever. They're here, right? There's millions of them here. What they're doing here, we don't know, okay? But how do we then make that into something in the future, right? We still have a whole life ahead of us. How do we become um, a bigger sibling to our Pacific Island brothers and sisters so it doesn't happen to them? And they're not bullied. That's my point because I have many more years, hopefully, left in this industry. <laughs> well, you yeah. know, and you talk yeah. about the Marshall, the Marshall Islands. You know, the Chinese have a big presence in the Marshall Islands. Ergo, yeah. that uh, ergo that oil tanker under Marshallese flag is really Chinese, and we've heard that from from other guests on our shows. Oh, and you so, have? Yes. Y- yeah. Yes. Oh. Well, yes. Yes. Yeah, we're talking about uh, Chris. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Chris Cottrell. Yes. Yeah, who you know. Yeah. yeah okay, okay. He spent plenty of time up there. Anyway, um, yeah. I want to get a handle on where you think this is all going. I mean, I mean, in your in your in, in an ideal sense uh, and in a, re- a realistic sense, uh, where is the where are the Philippines going? I mean, it has great promise, but you know, it is a democracy, and there is voting, and there is there are governmental legislative machinations, just like in this country, which may be volatile and unpredictable. And if yeah. you talk about having a steady policy, a steady policy with regard to relations with the U.S. and uh, you know geopolitical, geopolitical diplomatic connections with all these places around you, which I agree are very important. You have to have a stable government. So query, what does it look like? See, the difference between the Philippines and the U.S. is the Philippine military has a mandate to protect the Philippine constitution. So if any government official leader kind of falls out of line, they're a check and balance. See, like that's something that makes us very different. So I'll leave that to you. Um, but the realistic situation is we are finding more and more fighting age Chinese um, undocumented here in the country that are up north, hmm. closer to Taiwan. Yes. Um, what is going to happen? I don't know. Again, but there's a reason why they're there. you know. And again, it's an, only a matter of time because China is running out of many resources that they need to survive. They can't feed their people anymore and they you know they can't do that so worst case scenario is i I don't know they they take all our fish and 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 take over taiwan because taiwan still has all these other resources i think that that's the reason why they want to do that right um but the best case scenario i think would be for the philippines and the first island chain to to contain taiwan in the south i mean to contain china in the south china sea and and force them to go all around the world and not be able to pass our lanes. Yeah, you know, they say that uh, if uh, Ukraine wins against Russia, that'll be a signal to China that you can't do aggression against your neighbor. And it will yep. uh, reduce the possibility that China would attack uh, Taiwan. And so if uh, the Philippines are strong, if the relationship with the Philippines and the U.S. is strong, um, that's another indicator for China that it doesn't it doesn't pay to attack Taiwan. So um, it's part of a larger comprehensive, but it affects their uh, strategical thinking for sure. You know, you mentioned one thing, Carla, that I want to follow up on. You say there there are Chinese in the Philippines, and there are yeah. Americans in the Philippines, um, and there are Filipinos everywhere in the world, <laughs> everywhere. Um, yes. Which is to your credit and to twelve credit. million, twelve, 12 million, million right. overseas Filipinos. Yeah. So, what do you see the future of that? I mean, are you going to, you know, if I really get tired and fed up with what's going on in Congress here in the United States, what about the Philippines? Philippines is the place I could go to and retire to. Uh, you're going to let Definitely. me. Definitely. Actually, we have a special program. I'm not kidding. We have a special program for retirees in the Philippines. Um, your U.S. healthcare system, I feel like I'm an ad, but your, the U.S. Medicare works here, um, like a private healthcare service. And I believe some people have actually done that to take advantage of it and are pretty happy with it. Look, there's 7,000 islands. We're happy to have 
people like you definitely who who love the islands just as much as we do. <laughs> have you resolved yeah. have you resolved the uh, insurrection uh, groups uh, around the Philippines or are they still active? Yeah. Um I think we have. We have um they're not they're kind of more guerrilla fighters. Um mm. they've lost all ideology. I think there's maybe a, a couple of thousand left. Uh you know from 50,000. Um but Really, where we have to move our 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 you know lines of defense are are towards our external defense um and use technology. I think more than people, we need to use technology um because there's so much water and so many islands to cover. It's crazy. Well, I'm getting the idea yeah. that um, that the Philippines cares about technology, wants to develop a its technology a, its, its technology sector. Uh, and develop it for mm, not only um, defense, but for everything else to be in the, what did you call it, the defense pipeline, uh, supply yeah. line. Yeah. And maybe yeah. there are other things too. Do you see the Philippines as becoming a more technological country, sort of like India? So the Philippines is um, does a lot of business process outsourcing and has taken a lot of business away from India because we obviously speak better English. India, though, has good programmers. Um, what will work to our advantage, especially in the def critical defense um, industry, is that we are a partner. Um, and so, you know, we, ha we have very uh, favorable tax incentives, um, especially in economic zones for new industries. So I think that would be um, attractive. Um, and uh, again, the security of having your own island. Um, and being able to protect whatever you're building around it is very, very uh, attractive for investors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sure is. That sounds great. Yeah. But but the yeah. government has to protect that individual, that community for sure. That's true. That's true. Exactly. So let me, we only have a few minutes later, Carla. Or late. Yeah. We only have a few minutes to go. And um, I just uh, I want to just ask you about yourself. How did you get to be a, a security analyst? Um, what's your range of activities, your range of expertise? Uh, where, did you, where, did you, where did you get training for that? How do you be, I want to become one too, you know? Uh, <laughs> how, did you, how did you do that? Did you do that at the Sorbonne? Um, I actually, you know, I always wanted to join the military. And um, my parents were not thrilled. I, played, I, th I thought I was a boy, I think. But uh, I, went to, I went to school in Australia. I went to law school and I studied international studies. I majored in global security. And it's always been something... I was always interested in nuclear deterrence. I, it, was, it fascinated me. Um, and then, but I also never wanted to come home because I felt there was nothing at home here. Uh, it's not a natural thing for us to work for our family's businesses. And my family business didn't really interest me. Let's put it that way. So um, I joined the World Economic Forum um, as a writer and then learned about how technology could, could, could essentially democratize change and, and kind of help us leapfrog the many years that we had lost through corruption and greed and extractive institutions and I said okay wait maybe these new technologies are a thing so I, I taught myself how to code um and then I joined did an you office really in the now that's determination yeah. isn't it <laughs> yeah yeah maybe boredom but yeah so I taught myself how to code and I learned blockchain it fascinated me the the technology and the the tenants behind blockchain technology was something I thought we could apply to secure democratic institutions, elections, identity systems, et cetera. Um, and then I worked under Amir Dosal in the UN Office of Partnership, I ran 150 blockchain pilots in, 19, in 2018. And then I wrote my government and asked if I could work for them. So I did. And uh, I think they never got a letter like that ever. Um, and I learned, I learned on the job. I, uh, my, my sheltered, I guess, upbringing allowed me to stay very idealistic. And that I think many of the things I see and many, a lot of the change I want to happen in my life today is because 
I grew up with so much and I see so many people with so little getting taken away from them. And I don't believe that's right. So, you know, defense and security is your first line to protecting your nation's integrity. And I think that's why I'm, I'm here. And that's why I love my job and what I do. What a yeah. beautiful story. Would you ever yeah. run for office? I don't think I can sing and dance. If Michael will tell you the elections here, you're required to sing and dance. But um, if given the opportunity, I would love to. I would love to. Yeah. Okay. Well, sure. yeah. I, I guess maybe you should study a little singing and dancing then. <laughs> I'll finish my master's first. I'm writing my master's. Priorities. Yes, yes, yes. I only have Thank one you. more question for you, Carla. Yes. And that is, will you come back and share some more at another time? Can we talk to you again? To. <laughs> yes, yes, please. I would love to. I would love to. There's there's a lot we can talk about. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> I hope to hear from your viewers. If you have any questions, put them in touch. You know, we, we'd love to just share more about what's happening here. I think people need to be educated about what's going on here. We're not that far from each other. And it's it's a problem that we all need to understand on our yeah. own. Yeah. Hands across the sea, for sure. Well, exactly. I'm not. I'm not exactly. going to say uh, au revoir, but I. But I will say a tout à l'heure. <laughs> Mahalo. Mahalo. Thank Aloha. you. Mahalo. Aloha. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Carla. Aloha. Stay well, Jay. Bye. Bye.